Hello, this is Aaron DeMent, Vice President of Sterilization Technologies from Sterigenics. I would like to welcome you to this webinar filmed live in Spain at a customer seminar, which covers the foundational concepts of the interconnection between microbiology and sterilization. It serves as a showcase of the relationship between our two business units, Sterigenics and Nelson Laboratories, in the sterilization science and testing services. I would like to pass this over now to Jennifer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Giggy with Nelson Laboratories. I work in the consulting group as an expert technical consultant, and I'd like to share with you this presentation that I recorded on an introduction to basic microbiology and sterilization. Um, we put the basic microbiology and sterilization seminar piece at the front because there's a lot of topics in here that are going to be pretty important to understand sterilization um, and what we're trying to achieve with it, how it works. And then you'll take that and you'll apply it to the various modalities. And a lot of the, you know, it's like the foundation that we're building because they're going to go into a lot more depth about radiation and EO and maybe some novel sterilization as well. So what we'll be looking at is microbes, um, bio burden, BET testing, some of these tests and some of these concepts that uh, are very important to know for, for this topic. To start with, uh, we'll go with microbiology. What is microbiology? Well, micro means small, bio means life, and ology is the study of. So microbiology is the study of tiny things. And when people ask me what I do, and I say I'm a microbiologist, and what do microbiologists do? Well, we study tiny things. Except for I was surprised when I got my first job and I was lugging 50-pound tubs of, of things around. It wasn't quite what I expected. But um, when we're talking about microbes, and you'll see this with a lot of the terms and definitions that we use, we like to use lots of different names to talk about the same thing, just to make life confusing. Uh, microbes are also called bugs. We call them germs. We call them microorganisms. They're things like molds and yeast and bacteria and viruses uh, that are super, super small. And normally, we would have a video in here that would kind of show you uh, how small small really is and it starts out with like a human hair and then it zooms in and it starts to show you dust and it zooms in and zooms in and finally you see uh, some of these microbes we won't see that but trust me when i say that they're very small it's not something that you can see with your eyes it's something that we have to see another way either through a microscope with a hundred times magnification or with some of these tests that we'll do when we're looking at microorganisms. We're mostly concerned when it comes to sterility with the bacteria. And that's because not all organisms are as hard to kill or inactivate as others. And generally the easiest are the viruses. And that's funny because, you know, we've spent the last few years in a global pandemic caused by a virus that's been wreaking havoc. But viruses are actually very easy to kill on, on surfaces. Uh, next is going to be maybe your molds and your yeast, and then you'll, you'll move up to the bacteria. And as far as bacteria go, there's also a gradient. Some are very easy to kill and some are very hard. So it becomes important to know what, what is on your devices if you're trying to sterilize them. And we like microbes a lot because we use them to make uh, foodstuffs, like bread is made with yeast. Uh, we use bacteria and yeast to make cheese and yogurt and, and wine and other alcohol. And um, bacteria in the soil are going to decompose organic matter. Bacteria in our guts are going to help us to digest our food. We have bacteria all over our bodies. Uh, but there's certain bacteria that will make us sick. And so it's important when we're talking about medical devices that they're sterile or that they don't have any microbes on them. And there are certain parts of our body, particularly our blood streams and our cerebral spinal fluid and our tissues, where we don't have microbes. And it's important to keep those areas clean. Otherwise, we'll get infections. And knowing what is on the product then becomes very important. And how we figure out what those organisms are uh, is through a series of tests. 
The first one will be the gram stain. If you want to be famous, you just need to invent something. And, and a man with the last name of Graham invented this four-step staining process. And based on the difference in the cell wall of organisms, they either will come out purple or pink at the end of this four-step staining process. And so we'll call the purple ones gram-positive, and we'll call the pink ones gram-negative. And if we're trying to figure out what organisms we have, we've now taken, say, the population of the Earth and divided them into male and female. So we haven't really gotten very specific, but we're, we're kind of going to start to narrow things down. Uh, the next piece we can use is the gram morphology. And you can see here the, <laughs> the purple ones, are, are they look like little balls. So they're called cocci. So little round, they're called cocci. And if they're longer, then they're called rods. And sometimes they're really, really long. Uh, this particular one is an E. coli. It's kind of a, a shorter one. And so now we may have differentiated the world of bacteria into the equivalent of humans with males and females above and below, say, the age of 40. So we're starting to specify things a little bit more, but not a whole lot. The next piece would be morphology or colony morphology. When organisms grow on a solid surface, they develop some characteristics that are a little bit more unique and help us to distinguish them. But you can see the, in the center of that picture there, this is a bio burden plate. So it's on a piece of auger, and then I have a filter. So the little grid patterns are in the filter to help them count and keep track of where they are on the plate. You can see on this filter that the one in the center, the morphology for it would be cream, irregular, raised, wrinkled. Cream is the color, so it's kind of a cream color. Raised uh, means that it's growing up, and there are some that actually grow flat. And then it's irregular because it's not round. You can see its, its edges are kind of like a coastline instead of uh, a nice um, circle. And it's wrinkled. And wrinkled is kind of unusual, so I like to have this one on here. If you look below it, uh, that one is a little darker in color, so we might call it light tan. And it's kind of round. It's also raised. Uh, these types of physical descriptions of how an organism looks on a plate are very useful. You will find, however, that there's only so many shades of brown. Right, so your morphologies are going to be, you know, cream, light cream, maybe dark cream, and then a light tan, and then a tan, and then a dark tan. Um, earth tones, that's what most bacteria will be, and that's a good thing, realistically speaking, because for some strange reason, color is kind of not good. If you have anything that's not an earth tone, particularly an orange, or a pink, or a red, those organisms tend to be a little harder to kill. So, so brown is beautiful in this case. Uh, if you want to get a little more specific, you can do an identification. And they do that either by doing a bunch of tests to see if it grows in this sugar or that sugar. That's kind of the real old school way these days. Everybody would prefer to just put it on a genetic sequencer, get its DNA, and then match it to a library. Now that is very specific. That's like taking your DNA and putting it into a database and figuring out who you are. And now we know exactly what's on your product if you go with that. Uh, how much identification work is really necessary? Well, the more information that you have about your product and your facility microbiology, the more information you have to make decisions. However, the cost difference between a gram stain and colony morphology to a genetic sequence is four or five times the cost. So you really have to weigh those individually. Most companies are going to look at a bio burden plate, say this example plate here. They'll have the analyst scan it, and you'll notice that some of these look very similar. That light tan, raised round. I can see a few others that look just like that. And that's typical of what we'll see. And they'll look at the plate. They'll see top three, top five most predominant 
most common morphologies, and they'll do a gram stain morphology on those. If you have anything with color, they'll recommend that you actually identify those to make sure uh, that they aren't one of those nasty bugs that's really hard to kill. And of course, it would be a good idea to have a maybe not a very frequent, but once in a while, identify two species in genus level what exactly is on your product or in some of your uh, environmental monitoring areas, just so that you have that and can fall back on it. But it wouldn't be necessary nece necessarily to do it every, every quarter or with that kind of frequency. Knowing what organisms are on your product can be very helpful. There are some trends. Uh, for instance, if you have gram negatives, gram negatives aren't super common. And if you have them, they also are, tend to be the ones that make people more sick. Uh, but they are usually going to be pseudomonas if you've got it on your product. Because that, for some reason, lives really well in water. And water, water doesn't have a lot of nutrients. It doesn't promote growth. And, and so pseudomonas is very hardy and it lives in water. If you've got a pseudomonas or gram-negative problem, maybe you need to go check out your water. If you're looking at gram-positive cocci, those tend to come from people. We have different types of them on our skin, um, and so that's maybe where, where those have come from. If you have rods, gram-positive rods, or you have those molds and yeast, they're generally coming from your environment. But again, this isn't very specific. It's not going to pinpoint you. It's just a place to maybe start uh, your investigation, to start looking. This is a diagram, which when I look at it, it's, it's really, really busy, but that's the point. This is kind of the product microbiology, and if you look carefully, you can see a lot of places where you can be getting microbes into your devices. They can be coming from your raw materials, and we don't have one raw material. We have maybe sometimes dozens of raw materials that come in and each one of them are coming from a different environment where they could be picking up microbes. Our personal manufacturing facilities, again, have all sorts of areas with people uh, and with air handling, and there's microbes in the environment, there's microbes on people. Uh, these could all be sources for things. Um, and a lot of us have water in our processes. It's very common when people are sending something through consulting and they're looking for, we're getting a lot of these with BET right now, where they have high BET and uh, high endotoxin levels and people are going to their facilities looking at the process to try and figure out what could be causing these excursions. And it, they say they have no water in the process and then you go to the facility and you're like, well, what about that step? Oh, well, yeah, I guess. So there's lots of little nooks and crannies where you can be getting microbes into your, into your product and knowing what's in each one of these branches on this, what's in your environment, what's coming in on your raw materials. This can all be helpful information if you have something on the end and you have an excursion on the end trying to trace it back. Our next topic is bio burden testing. Bio, again, means life, and burden would mean load. The bio burden is the microbial load on something. Uh, and it's usually expressed in a number, and that number would be CFU, or colony forming units. Uh, if you send in some product for a bio burden, they will do a bio burden test. They'll give you a report with a number. Uh, that number tells you how many. It doesn't tell you who or what, it just gives you, uh, gives you a number. And we're going to call it a bio burden estimate because there are a lot of factors or variables that can affect that number. The first one is actually the CFU or colony forming unit. And most of the time, we assume that one organism lands in one spot on the filter and grows and grows and grows into this big mound that we can visibly see and count. But it's possible, because microorganisms tend to be kind of sticky, that you could have a clump, uh, as is in my photo here, and if you kind of try to read that, I mean, that's 20 plus organisms stuck together. 
and that then, as a clump, deposits and grows into a visible colony. So we can't tell if it's one or if it's many that created the CFU. That's one reason why we'll call it an estimate. And the second uh, picture here uh, is, a, is a bio burden plate, and you can see there's quite a few little colonies on that, but if you looked at this to try and figure out what to gram stain, uh, obviously I see two really easily. I've got this yellow one, and yellow is one of those exceptions for color. It's probably a micrococcus, and that's not going to be bad. And then you can see this other one here again. It's light tan. We'd call that mucoid because it's kind of like mucusy and yeah. Uh, probably two different organisms on the bio burden, but you'd have maybe a hundred CFU, but it's just two different bugs. Okay, I've got a video here. We're going to see if this one's going to play. So here we are. This is a mock bio burden test that uh, they did. They call this the kazoo catheter because they created this. But we have to get the organisms off of the device and onto that filter. So they'll take the device, they'll chop it up, so that they can extract the organism from all the different surfaces, and then they're going to add a liquid to it, and they're going to shake it. Uh, that's a stomacher. This is an orbital shaker. And this is just to move the liquid around and try and get the bugs washed off of the... That's a sonicator. So lots of different methods that they'll use. This is the Friday night shake. So you can get all your friends together and have a lot of fun. Uh, once we've got the organisms off of the product and into the liquid, now we have to get the liquid into the filter. So we'll use membrane filtration. Uh, they're going to weigh this so they know exactly how much they've filtered. So we can do the math at the end. If we filter half the liquid, then they have to multiply all the counts by two to figure out what was on the device. Run all of it through the filter, and then they'll just take this filter and place it on an auger plate. That's the end of the video. They'll put that in the incubator, they'll grow it up, and then we'll get all those little things like we saw on the picture. So that's a bio burden test. Uh, notice here he's in a hood, this is a, uh, but, and he's wearing gloves, but he's just got a lab coat on. He's not really wearing anything special. That will come into play a little bit in a moment. So bio burdens, you know, it's, it's a... It's less intensive than a sterility test uh, because I'm just trying to get a count. Um, I'm looking for, I can go aerobic bacteria, I can go molds and yeast, I can go spores, I can go anaerobes. I could take that 100 mils or 200 mils that's in the bottle, I could divide it into four different spots, like 25, 25, 25, 25, put those filters on four different plates, and incubate them on different augers and in different conditions to get these different counts. Um, for an aerobic, I would put it right in the incubator. For a mold, I would put it on a special auger that's better for molds and put it at a lower temperature. For a spore, I would heat shock it at a high temperature, the liquid, before I filtered it, and then I would incubate that. For an anaerobe, I would take my filter and I would stick it in a special container with some chemicals that suck out all the oxygen uh, so those would grow. <clears throat> so I can differentiate that way, uh, but most of the time people are just going to test their aerobic and their, fun and their fungal counts. Now, why would that be? That's because most anaerobes are what we call facultative, meaning that they don't do as well, they prefer not to have oxygen, but they can still grow with oxygen. And so you'll get those in your aerobic count as well. Um, and spores are the same thing. Spores will grow in a normal aerobic count. And so most of the time people will just do the aerobic and the fungal. If you think you have uh, a need, maybe you're doing EO sterilization and you're having some tr trouble and you're wondering if maybe your resistance is higher on because you have spores, uh, you could do a spore count to see what proportion of your bio burden is spores, but most of the time it's not necessary to do. It's just something that's, that's extra and it's out there. And if you do the spores and the anaerobes, remember that you don't take this plus this plus this and add them together because, again, they're really overlapping. <clears throat> to make sure that our bio burden is good, 
Here's another piece about the estimate part. We don't get everything off when we wash or do that extraction. We need to know how much we did so we can do some math to make the number closer. Uh, and that's what we call a recovery efficiency or an extraction efficiency or some even might call it the method suitability for the bio burden test. There's two ways we can do this. The first way is going to be a repetitive recovery. And so this is an orbital shaker. We're going to run that whole test that we saw in the video. And then we're going to plate that. And then instead of sending the bottle with the device to the washroom, we're going to put it back on the scale, add the liquid to it again, and wash it, extract it a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And our goal is to get to zero. And we can usually do this in four times, so we just do it four times. And then we'll take whatever we got off the first and divide it by the total of all four. And that gives me a percentage, so I know how much I got off the first time versus what's really on there. And I can apply that percentage to, um, to my count. So, because I don't do math in my head well, let's say that our CFU count was 100. My extraction efficiency or recovery efficiency was 50%, which means that my 100 CFU on the plate is really reported as 200 CFU in the report. Because I think I got about half off, I need to double my counts. There's another way we can do this, because we will do it with the normal bio burden like this, or we can do an inoculated product. In an inoculated product, we're going to just take a solution with Bacillus atrophius, and we're going to put the solution on there with a known CFU per milliliter, and I'm going to put 100 organisms on that device, and then I'm just going to run the test four times and see what I get. Is one better than another? There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the short answer is going to be, if you have a decent amount of bio burden, say 20 plus, maybe, do it with your regular product because that's the most representative. If you have a super clean product, and there are some that are manufactured in a way that they are just really, really clean, the math doesn't work when you start with numbers less than 10 and you're doing extraction efficiencies, the math gets all squirrely. Uh, so in those cases where your product's really clean, I would do the inoculated product. Ah, sterility testing. Sometimes called a test of sterility, sometimes called a test for sterility. Um, when would you use one over the other? The test of sterility, or the ISO test, is for terminally sterilized product. So you make the product, and then you send it to the irradiator, or you send it to the EO facility, it gets sterilized. You should be following the ISO method. Uh, the USP method is for aseptic processing. Aseptic processing means I take my container, and I sterilize it, and I take my my drug product or whatever, and I try to sterilize it. And then I put those two together as cleanly as possible and under conditions that I really hope that no organisms get in while I'm putting it together. And then I send it out the door for the patients to use. And if you're doing that, then you would follow USP. Now we're going to watch a video here on a sterility test. And I want you to notice how this differs from a bio burden test. In concept, it's very similar because I need to take the device and I need to get it into some kind of a liquid. Uh, and so you'll see here that um, by this is an actual product instead of my simulated kazoo catheter, but he needs to. Uh, uh, the sample packaging you can is opened in an turn the, vol uh, the volume on this video. I, 
He's got to be very careful. You see, he's got gloves. He has a clean room suit, head covered, so goggles, no skin showing, because if anything were to come to off of his media. skin and fall into this bottle, this uh, we can't tell the difference if it came from the product or if it came from the analyst. Uh, he's going to be very, very careful in how he's disassembling this, uh, just as the, the bio burden test. Um, but it's a little, the stakes are higher here because this is a pass fail and one organism will cause the test the to pass are or to fail. To so he has to get this testing. into the bottle without touching it using instruments. And, and if you're wondering, that yellow thing in the back is actually, it's an air sampler. So uh, they're monitoring to make sure that there aren't any microbes in the air in the hood. And he's going to cut this all into little pieces so the media can get inside in case there's organisms that are inside. You see when we're talking about EO sterilization, the inside is the hardest to, to get. So we've got to make sure that uh, our media is in there and that's part of the test. The sample is fully immersed. And all right, so there's your sterility. Of 14 days. <laughs> Sterility, like bioburden, has a method suitability or a validation qualification test that goes with it. Um, we also used to call this BF or bacteriostasis fungostasis. Uh, and this purpose is really to show that there isn't anything on the product that's going to cause us to not see microbes. Uh, is there anything that's inhibitory or kills microbes that they could be there and we wouldn't see for some reason? Uh, what we're going to do is use a panel of different organisms. Uh, in this case, this is a USP uh, test, so we've got six organisms. I have a mold, I have a yeast, I have some gram positives and some gram negatives. Nice variety of organisms so I can tell hopefully with that set uh, whether or not there's anything in there that's going to cause inhibition or things to not grow either to be bacteriostatic meaning it's making it so they can't grow or there's also bactericidal where it's killing them. Uh, you, can, um, uh, you can see that these are all growing. Uh, the one that says CS would be Clostridium sporogenes. That's an anaerobe. But you can tell if you look at them, like this first one here has some little puff balls in the bottom. I think that's Aspergillus niger. Uh, and then the next one, there's stuff on the bottom. It looks clear, uh, but this, there's stuff on the bottom. And then this one has growth, third one has throughout. The next one, it's like it's raining in there, so there's growth coming down. And then I've got growth all the way throughout on the CS one. And the last one also seems to have stuff just coming down. There's some, some characteristic growth that you can see in liquid, but most of the time you can't. And if I were to take any one of these and go like that, then it would all be gone. Because the stuff on the bottom would come up into solution and these ones that have the raining down stuff would all just mesh around. And, and so this isn't a very good way to identify organisms, but it works really well for this test because they know exactly what these look like. And there are some that are very characteristic. But they're going to put just a few organisms in, less than 100, into the bottle after it's incubated for a week or two with the product. That gives time for any chemicals or things on the product to leach out so that all the toxins are in the liquid. And then they'll add the 100 or less organisms and see if it grows. And if it grows, they assume that, that everything's good. And if it doesn't, then there's something that people didn't tell us. And we find this happens very often when this method suitability fails and they go back and say, you failed method suitability, okay, why? And there's an antibiotic that they've embedded into the product so that, you know, or something uh, that they forgot to tell the lab about. And this isn't a problem. There are some ways that they can neutralize it, but they just need to make sure that they, they know that and they can take those steps before so that they get rid of whatever that chemical is before 
um, so that their data, again, would be reflective in, in value. The next test we'll talk about is the bacterial endotoxin test, also called LAL. We call it BET. Uh, LAL was like luminous amoebocyte lysate. Um, and this is a test for pyrogens. Pyrogens are fever-causing com compounds. Um, and they found that gram-negative, so remember there's a difference in the cell wall, the gram-negative bacteria have a lipopolysaccharide in their cell wall. And this piece actually causes, it's a pyrogen, so it causes fever in people. So you can kill all the organisms on the device, but pieces of their dead bodies then will still make some people sick, which means that anytime you have uh, something that's contacting the blood or the cerebral spinal fluid or the deep tissue, it needs to be checked for endotoxin. This picture here is a horseshoe crab. I don't know how, but somebody figured out that the blood of a horseshoe crab has a component in it that binds with this lipopolysaccharide. You always wonder how people figure these things out. But it was great for the crabs because the crabs now are protected because we need them for this test. Uh, and they will harvest them from, from the near shore, I guess. There's places where they'll, they'll collect them, they'll extract some blood, and then they send them way over here. And by the time they work their way all the way back up to where they will extract them, it'll be like us giving blood, and we've had our six weeks to recoup, and, and so the, crab, or the horseshoe crabs are not harmed in the process. Uh, they get a nice protected zone where they can be, uh, and we get to use their blood to make this, um, what do they call it, the, the endotoxin uh, test component. Gel clot was the first test method. We don't use that very much anymore, but they would just put the blood in with the extract from the device, and it's going to be very similar to a bioburden. They're going to take the device, they're going to cut it up, they're going to put it in a liquid, and then they might shake it a little bit. Uh, they're going to do it in a heated incubator that's going to be about body temperature to try and extract that compound, the lipopolysaccharide, into the solution. And then they would mix it with this endotoxin thing, and um, it would clot, make a clump. And if they turned the tube and it had a clump in it, then they knew it was positive. These days, we have very fancy equipment that's going to scan that. They're going to, the turbometric is looking for its binding, and so there's clumps that they can see that way. Um, and the chromogenic, I think it's tied to a, they've tied it to a color compound so that they can scan for the color. And if they see color, it means that, that, that they've had a reaction. Uh, we're going to want to test these with every lot. And it's usually between 3 and 10. It would be the sample size that you would send through for every lot to see if you have any endotoxin. And like I said, we've been having a lot of people have endotoxin problems recently. I have no idea why. Um, so now we're getting into sterilization a little bit. Validation approaches. There's three main ways that people will validate their sterilization process. The first is the overkill. This is very typical with EO or STEAM. And we're going to use a biological indicator, or a BI. It's going to have a really hard to kill organism on it. We're going to put a lot of it. So 10 to the 6, that's a million spores. And we usually use spores because they're the hardest to kill on this biological indicator. And then we're going to throw that in the hardest to reach spot on the device. So hard, hard, hard. And we're going to put it in a half cycle or half the sterilization dose or time. And then we're going to see if we killed it. If we killed 10 to the 6, we can extrapolate and say, OK, that's a, we can say we killed 10 to the 6. There's another 10 to the 6. Uh, and there's our sterility assurance of 10 to the minus 6. Uh, the other one is the bio burden base. That's 
mostly used for radiation sterilization. And we're going to look at what's on the product. We're going to sterilize it based on what's on the product, how many and how hard those ones are to kill. And this is, this is how we do most radiation. Uh, the BI bioburden based is kind of a hybrid approach where you're using a BI, but it's not 10 to the 6. And it's not the super hardy. You know, you, we're, we're trying to bring that down to the level that's closer to our bio burden, but we're still using BIs. And I think we'll go into a lot more detail on that later on uh, in the seminar. <clears throat> when we are looking at how hard, I have my easy to kill, I have my hard to kill, we measure that in a term we call D value. Um, and this is the time or the dose that's required to kill one log of organisms. Now, here's some math. I have to do some math. If I want to kill five logs and the D value is two minutes, so I have 10 to the fifth. That's a lot of organisms on a product. At 10 to the fifth, D value is two minutes. How do I do it? Okay, 10 to the fifth CFU, D value is two minutes. Five logs times two minutes. Okay, it's going to take me 10 minutes to reduce five down to zero. I much prefer the graph. So if we look at this on the graph, I have my line up there. <clears throat> it starts at 10 to the fifth, and my pointer would be absolutely ridiculous. Okay, up oh, there's 10 to the fifth, it's coming down to zero. And zero hits me at, oh, I can't do it, 10, 10. it hits at 10, so at 10 minutes. And that's much easier to see. And you can kind of see how it comes down two minutes uh, every, every time. <clears throat> Sterility assurance level, or SAL, we used to call this PNSU, which was the probability of a non-sterile unit, because we like to use lots of names. Uh, the SAL is a probability of having a non-sterile unit in your in your um, in your lot, if I say I have a ten to the minus six SAL, that means I have a probability of one non-sterile unit in a million devices. Sounds pretty good, right? I like my odds on that. If I was going in for surgery, one in a million always sounds really good. If I say I have an SAL of 10 to the minus 3, that means that I have a probability of a non-sterile unit of one possibly non-sterile unit in a thousand that I sterilized. I like my odds that way better of winning the lottery if that, you know, that would be so much better. But <clears throat> why would I care if my SAL is 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 6? And this is kind of an interesting discussion that's in its very early stages right now. Um, the magic number, does anyone know which one of these is the best? I mean, what, what do your companies do? Does any, 10 to the minus 6? Does anybody do 10 to the minus 3? Did I hear a yes? So what is the product that you sterilize at 10 to the minus 6? So they're purchasing some 10 to the minus 3 product. I think in the future we may see more. The hard part is, is the industry is so set on 10 to the minus uh, 6, and there are some instances where we're having trouble getting that kind of sterilization because you'll see that sterilization is kind of hard. Anything that's designed to kill microorganisms may be kind of hard on some other things. And the question really becomes, does everything need to be 10 to the minus 6? Is there a difference in a Band-Aid that I'm putting on my skin versus an implant that I'm putting in my spine? And do they both need to be the same? And the question will need to be answered, hopefully, in the next decade or so. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if they finally make this a little bit easier. There are a few, few products that can be sterilized to a lower SAL. But you always have to be able to explain why you can't hit 10 to the minus 6. And it always has to be for a low risk device. Then we ask ourselves, why is 10 to the minus 6 the magic number? 
good because I give <laughs> because if somebody knew I would be like oh yeah a, the best that anybody has been able to figure out of my colleagues is that somebody just proposed it decades and decades ago when they were trying to figure out how we're going to do this and said well, let's try one in a million. Good. That sounds good. <laughs> and, and I remember being a young kid and thinking, wow, a million dollars. That is so much money. And, and it's, I mean, home values. There, there's so many homes these days in my area that are like a million dollars. And wow, they're not, they're not even that nice. <laughs> when, when I was a kid, a million dollars was this huge mansion and you were a movie star. And, and now it's, it's not necessarily. But a million, you know, what, 10 to the minus six, somebody just thought that was a good number and it seems to have worked. Uh, but a lower number would probably work just as well in a lot of instances. And as we're looking at ways to try and do things, um, perhaps, perhaps in the future. Now let's go back to the graph because I like the graph. Um, how would we do sterility assurance level graphically? Now here's an EO kill curve. Uh, in real life, these are not straight lines. These are tapered a little bit in the fronts and the backs, but we're assuming a D value of two minutes, as in our previous example. We're assuming a BI of 10 to the six, so a million spores on a BI, because that's what we normally do. And, and this is how it looks. It starts up here at 10 to the six, and it's a 12 log reduction, so I'm gonna end up 24 minutes or 20, 24 minutes in my cycle, and I will get 12 log reduction, 10 to the minus 6 SAL. <clears throat> if it's radiation, again, this isn't the, uh, the overkill method. This is the bioburden-based method. I'm going to have a device, and VDMAX is going to be, VDMAX 25 is the favorite, uh, so that's going to be less than 1,000, so I started this kill curve here at 10 to the three, so this is a thousand bugs. And you'll notice that my slope goes down, which means that I have a smaller D value. So long or high D value is going to be really hard to kill. Tiny D value is easy to kill. So these organisms are much easier to kill than this uh, spore that I would be using. And in this instance, it looks like I have an SAL of 10 to the minus six at 10, a dose of 10. Now, where do I want to do my sterility testing? Do I want to do it? Oh, well, I was close. I was close. Do I want to do it down here? What am I going to get down there? Zero? I hope I get zero. I mean, that's, that's supposed to be sterile. What am I going to get up? Okay, up. Here, uh, it's going to grow. Remember, I, one organism in the jar is going to trip one of these types of tests up. So if I have a million, it's going to grow. If I have 10,000, it's going to grow. If I have 100, it's going to grow. If I have 10, it's going to grow. It isn't until I get into this middle range here around zero where, where I can get some meaningful data. If it's up, it's always going to grow, and if it's down, it's always going to not grow. So I need to be somewhere where I can get some information that's useful. And again, I don't want to test product down here. If I test terminally, fully terminally sterilized product, that tells me absolutely nothing, but that I have really, really great sterility analysts. That's, that's all that tells me, to test 10 samples out of, out of a batch. All right, our manufacturing environment. Remember our big graph, and we had all those areas where microbes could be coming in. So that's why we monitor our environments, because we need to know what's there, so we can find out if there's a relationship between that and our end product microbiology. We also need to know that our processes are under control. Uh, using the example of the water, right? Uh, sometimes in these instances where they go in and they figure out, maybe they don't clean, there's a water bath and it gets dipped in a water bath and the water bath doesn't get cleaned and so it's full of organisms. And maybe if they would just clean the water bath and change the water out every day, 
they, they might be able to eliminate a, a problem like that. Um, and what is required uh, to, to do with an environmental monitoring plan? Well, you need to create your plan, so you need to write it down. Say, this is what I am going to do. This is how often I'm going to do it. Get your frequency. I'm going to monitor every day. I'm going to monitor every week. I'm going to monitor every month. And then say where you're going to monitor and how you're going to monitor. Are you going to use, you know, fallout plates? Are you going to sample the water? Are you going to sample? Put it all down on paper. And then you need to set limits usually an action limit and an alert limit. The action limit is where you start to get concerned and think, oh, I need to take some action. And the alert limit is where you get really, really concerned and you start running around trying to figure things out in a hurry. Uh, and figuring out where those numbers would be, again, it's really hard to just come up with a number. It's so great if you have lots of information. And if you're there isn't a good necessarily like one number. Like here's a here's an example here. This is um, from an aseptic processing guideline, and I I write a lot of protocols, and putting acceptance criteria in a protocols is really really difficult because you're trying to say this is only good if I hit this number, but do you really know if that number is the number that's important? And with this example here, a lot of people we've seen are using a table like this because there's very few sources of written limits. And here's a written limit, and they'll just grab it and take it. We see this with particulate testing as well. USP has a, has a method for testing solutions. Uh, it's got limits in it, and so people will use those limits, but those limits are for drug products that are being injected into people, and so maybe those limits aren't the same limits that you would need to use for, for different types of devices. Um, but if you can hit these limits, you know, more power to you, that's, that's great. But these are for aseptic processing, which again is that time where you're taking pieces and putting them together and trying not to contaminate them. So these are going to be really strict limits to hit. Um, and sometimes it's, it's good to, I want to say a trial run, but when you're, when you're starting out, you want to collect data more frequently. And then over time, if you can show that you have process control and you're getting the same number every month or every week, then maybe you move to every month, every quarter. And once you've established what they are, and you can set some temporary limits and then go back after a year and look at those limits and say, well, I set limits here and I'm usually here and having alert and action limits that are not the same as where you normally are are not very meaningful. So you want to make sure your limit is not too high that you'll never hit it. And you want to make sure that it's not too low that you're going to hit it all the time. So figuring out what, where you should be uh, will take some time. And you may want to set your initial plan up to have a lot of monitoring and then to go back after at least a year and then readjust things. And then you want to define your actions. What am I going to do when I hit those limits? Uh, am I going to stop production? Am I going to, you know, what am I going to do? when I hit those limits. Um, and we see a lot of people who set those really harshly and say, if I hit, if I have an excursion in my manufacturing facility, I'm just going to stop all production and quarantine all my products. And that may be a little excessive. Sometimes we can see an increase in bio burden on the product. And the first thing they'll do is go back to their monitoring and they'll look at it and say, ooh, where could this be coming from? And find that all the monitoring is normal. And you can get the opposite where there's an excursion in the facility and the monitoring says there's lots more bio burden, but the end product, the bio burden isn't changing. 
And figuring out why there's a disconnect is part of the mystery. Uh, but they can be connected, and they can also not be connected, depending on where, it's, where the bio burden is coming from. Uh, so having actions that are appropriate, you wouldn't necessarily have a high bio burden and then stop all production unless you should. Uh, so that's part of, part of the joy of figuring out what level of control you need versus, versus someone else. There is some guidance, uh, and we'll put this on here. This is Amy TIR 52. Uh, this is a, it's a good read. It's not very long. And it will give you a lot of guidance on how to establish an environmental monitoring program, what types of monitoring that you should include. And when I say alert and action limits, it will tell you to set them. It will give you some information about what they mean, how they would differentiate. But it's guidance, and so it's not going to say, set it at this number, and that's your number, because um, they're all case dependent. And then there's more information, too, about what to do when you have an environmental monitoring excursion. So I would get that one if you don't have that one already. OK, here we are at the end. Um, key takeaways. I hope everybody's got an idea of what microbes are, how we want to characterize those, and what we want to do with that information. Maybe our bio burden, an understanding of what that is, why that matters, um, and sterility assurance. We're going to start calculating a lot of that stuff later on. More math, yay. Um, and then monitoring our environment. To learn more about Sotero Health, this topic, or to speak to a member of our team, please contact us at academy at soterahealth.com.